Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you for joining us online. Uh, you're going to be in for a treat tonight. You've got a, a few treats. So uh, I'm going to start with a little quick prayer, and then I'm going to do some, inter- some little house cleaning announcements and then some introductions. So, Father, we just thank you for your love and your mercy that you continue to bless us with new mercies every day. Lord, we need them. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide our hearts and minds to follow you and to uh, be willing to do what you put before us. Lord, we thank you for the pleasure to be able to meet in your name and to share your truth. And Lord, that it would help us to live a life more pleasing to you and more fulfilling to us, that we may glorify you and edify others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Um, So if you haven't been to Recovery Church, uh, what we do, it's basically we're trying to bring the 12 steps and the Bible back together. Uh, The the scriptures uh, were the foundation of the 12-step process, and we believe that that 12-step process is for life. Matter of fact, the founders of AA said that this was a good tool to live the Christian life for anybody. You don't need to have a substance issue. You don't need to be an alcoholic. Everybody deals with life issues. And this process, which is mostly from uh, the book of James, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, a little bit out of uh, the love chapter. And that was a good reminder to silence our phones. Um, and so uh, that's what we do, and that's what we teach, and that's what we preach here. But uh, we have some special guests tonight. I first uh, spoke with John and Tanya James back, I guess it's been about 10 12 years? I'm not sure. They were at a church down in Lake Worth, and uh, they've been involved in ministering to people in the recovery world for a while, and I was running a recovery center, and I got to know them through that, and they are now up in West Virginia, but are down here and agreed to come by and share their times and talents uh, with us, and we really appreciate that. Um, We are going to pass around a plate, so what do we do with that? Uh, That plate, nobody here makes any money. Uh, We're all volunteers. That pays for the the Bibles we give away. It pays for at the end, uh, the last Saturday of every month is testimony night, and we provide a meal. There's a testimony time. Somebody gives their testimony, and then we feed everybody and have some fellowship time. Normally what we do is we break out into men's and women's group after the the teaching of the message. But if you don't have a life recovery Bible, we want you to have one. Uh, uh, I've taken cases and cases of these out to the jail. Uh, because we think it's important that they have a new start to life, and that's a great way to do it. And so if you don't have a Life Recovery Bible, there's plenty here. Come and get it. We have other books that we want you to have as well. If you don't know, the the early founders of the 12-step process, this was their daily devotion, right? My utmost for his highest. So that's free as well. Uh, We've got Rediscover Church, which is really why we need to still be going to church in person, is I know I I appreciate all that join us online, and I know that some do it from far, far away and couldn't be here, but it's really important for us to gather together and be able to see each other eyeball to eyeball and rub elbows or fist pump or whatever it is. Uh, That's scriptural, and so it's, it's, it's also important for your recovery. If you're in recovery from anything, that you have that accountability and that connection. Healing the Shame, it's a great Christian book. If you don't know what this is about, you should probably get a copy. It's a wonderful book, been around forever by John Bradshaw, and shame is the root of a lot of what drove a lot of people into substance issues. What, am I, what on earth am I here for? A Rick Warren book that's excellent, and it takes a family, the family approach to recovery uh, by uh, Deborah J. and so that's another great one if you don't have that. I recommend it. There's several others down here. We want you to have them. Um, We're blessed with Tanya is going to do some worship, some live worship for us this week, so we're able to do that online. Normally, if we have recorded worship, we we can't broadcast that, so we are blessed with that today. And I'm not going to waste a lot of time because I want John to have as much time as possible to talk. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And thank you, Tanya. You're welcome. Good evening, church. start with some worship. John and I are so honored to be with you guys today, tonight. We're just expecting God to move, God to meet us. If he doesn't come, Lord, it's just another service and we need God to show up, right? Yeah. 
be seated. Father, we just thank you tonight. What an, what an absolute privilege and honor to be in your presence. God, to just to be able to come together as family, you know, people from different walks of life, different socioeconomic background, different nationality, different culture, but that common bond is family, one in Christ. God, we can just come together and worship you. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. May your name continue to be exalted and lifted up high this night. And Father, as we lift your name high up, God, that you would draw people to yourself, that you would draw us close to you this night, that we would leave this place different, set free, that our eyes would be open, that we would encounter you in a real and a powerful way tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. Where'd my wife, crikey, you're so quick, you just sneaked away. I'm going to get you to come back up here, darling, come on. Um, g'day guys, how you going tonight? You doing all right? Look at you brave people that have come out in person. Fantastic to see you here. If you've tuned in, we got people watching online. We want to say hello to the online family. If you're watching online, stop talking, put your phones down, pay attention. Uh, we want to remind everybody that is family online, we miss you guys. It's time to come back. You know, we celebrate technology. Isn't technology an amazing thing? That we have the use of technology for over the last year couple of years, you know, folks who have struggled with their health for, for, for many different reasons, ones that have been away and we've been able to use the online experience. But I want to remind us again tonight that the online experience was never meant to be a permanent replacement. And you're missed. It's not the same without you all here. You know, um, we're believing God for the miracle to bring my family over. I have two beautiful daughters in Australia. And because of all the lockdowns, shutdowns, every I haven't seen my daughters in three years. And Australia's starting to open up, eh, darling? And we're praying for them to come over this Christmas. that will be open. They'll be able to come. But I celebrate technology because it's been such a blessing to be able to talk with them online and, and be able to see their faces. And I say praise God for technology. But I've got I've to gotta say this. Even though technology is awesome and it's been a blessing, it doesn't come close till at Christmas when I'm standing there at the airport and I see my two daughters clear customs and walk out and I can actually go up and hold them and hug them and, and be with them and then to come home and be able to have meals together. There's nothing like that. And it's the same miracle about coming together in person. There is just something amazing that the Lord does when we can come together as the body of Christ that I believe you just can't experience through the online experience. And like I said, I'll say it again, praise God for technology, oh, but nothing compares to when we can come together just ordinary, dysfunctional people like you and I. Come on, eh? We're all on a journey of being changed into the image and likeness of Christ, eh? We all have wounds. We all have scars. We, we all have baggage. Uh, we've all gone through storms and shipwrecks. And you might be sitting there and listening online and think, well, I've been through no storms or shipwrecks. I'm like, be patient. There's one coming. And it has your name written on it. You know, that's just life, isn't it? 
And, and I look at my wife tonight, you know, she's up there leading us in worship. And, you know, I, I look at her from a distance and, and, and I think, okay, she's having a good hair day. The humidity hasn't affected your hair yet today. And uh, the, ma- the makeup's happening, the, the outfit's coordinated. And, and it's so easy to look at somebody and we can judge or evaluate them just from the outside. You know, I, I think in the culture we live in today, especially on social media, you know, we feel the pressure of keeping up the appearance that our lives are just perfect. <laughs> you know, you can be going through the most difficult season and dealing with painful things and struggling, but on social media, we'll still feel the pressure to post the picture of the perfect selfie. You can be struggling with things and carrying wounds and just going through the most difficult time of your life, but we'll still feel the pressure online on social media to post the picture of the perfect family, the perfect marriage. How about this one? The photograph online of the perfect children. But who knows, real world isn't like social media. And, you know, I look at my wife, um, and I don't know a miracle testimony of what God has done in her life, the incredible hope and healing and restoration, not only of what he has done, but what he continues to do. And just for a few moments, Dale, I'd I'd like you just to testify of this incredible God we serve, of the miracles that he's done in your life as a young girl growing up in the environment you were born into, the miracle of what he has done and what he continues to do for you. So I I was born into a family, I was telling my sister and here in the Lord um, earlier that I was born and my dad was an alcoholic growing up, so as a little girl, he'd go to work and he'd go to the bars right after that and he'd come home drunk and he'd punch holes in our wall and hit my mom and tear our furniture up, very physical, very aggressive, and we had a piano in the middle of our living room and I hid behind that piano pretty much my entire life growing up till my dad passed out, then I'd get out and go up to my room you know this is what the environment that I lived in but how many people know your home life will take its effect if it's bad on every part of your life socially I felt was failing academically I didn't have many friends I didn't want any friends to come home to my house because I didn't want them to see the dysfunction that I lived in so this is what I grew up and I had my mom and three sisters I'm a twin And um, I remember when I was 11, my dad started moving out, and he'd move in with other women, and he'd come back home, and my mom would always take him back. And he did this about 10 times, and I remember one time before Christmas, he came back, and I was 12 at that point. And I wrote a note, and I put it in his sock drawer, and I said, Daddy, I'm so glad that you're home this time. Please don't leave again. And a week later, he did, and that time it was for good. My mother tried to commit suicide, was unsuccessful, thank the Lord, but she suffered with a lot of mental illness from what my dad did to her. So you figure four teenage girls, unsupervised, will get in a lot of trouble, and we got in a whole lot of trouble. And I couldn't wait to leave the house when I was 18. I just, it represented so much trauma for me. My mom wasn't there. My sisters were just, we were all um, not good. You know, we weren't good from that environment because it does, I don't care what you say, it takes its toll on you. And um, when I was 18, I left the house. My sisters went to college. I went off to modeling school. And by the time I'm 24 years old, I'm married and divorced two times. Because how many people know hurting people hurt people? It's what we do. We don't know any better. And you attract what you think you deserve. And I felt like these men are going to walk out on me like my dad did. It's a whole lot easier when you leave Then they walk out on you, so I did. I left two marriages. I had a son by one of those marriages. And I got married for the third time, gave my life to the Lord at 26. I am on fire for God. We have a beautiful son. My life is heading in the right direction. I'm pastor of women's ministries in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I mean, on fire for God. Ten years into that marriage, it turned abusive. But I thought, I'm saved. I'm not walking out of this marriage. I'm not going through another divorce. I'm not doing that to my children. And 10 years, like, it got worse. The more I prayed, it doesn't make sense. The more I prayed, the worse he got. And I stayed in that relationship for 22 years. I almost died in the hospital till God was like, this is not what I have for you. This is not the best. And you've got to leave. And 
22 years, that marriage came to an end. And not only did that marriage come to an end, but my 18-year-old niece that was like my daughter, who was with me more than she was with my sister, committed suicide. Her just started her senior year of high school. So trauma, trauma, then my mother dies suddenly from cancer, all within like a year. And I packed my car with everything I could fit in it in New York State, and I drove to Florida, the furthest place away from New York State that represented so much hurt and pain and trauma for my life. I just could, didn't want to deal with New York. I just wanted to get away from everything that that place represented, which was hurt and pain and trauma for me. And I got to Florida, and I'm like, God, I'm going to become a nun. I'm just, I'm just going to serve the Lord till I figure it out. You don't, can't wear makeup. And I'm like, that's not going to work out for this girl. <laughs> anyway, so I, I'm like, I started a construction company. I'm getting my life turned back around. But you know what? I was mad at God. I was mad at God. God, you failed me. And I didn't do a lot of things right when I got here. I still was had one foot in the world because I felt like God just, what good is it to serve the Lord if this is going to happen to me anyway, right? What good is it? I felt like I was going to be protected from all the bad things in the world. But bad things happen to good people. They just do. And either I kept looking back at the like, why did you do this? Why did Alicia die? Why did this happen to my marriage? I'm supposed to be, a, you know, pastor and, you know, I had this worked out in my head how it was going to go and it went nothing like that and it shipwrecked me it really did so I was praying I'm just like God is healing my heart well then I meet this awesome man it's, I'm a Christian recording artist we met through music in Florida and um, I remember he called and, and uh, we ministered together for the first time um, in a beautiful recovery place in Greenville, Florida, which we're at every six weeks to speak at the speakers. And the first time we ministered together, he's like, just come and do worship. I'm going to speak. It'll be good. And the, the first time we ministered together, I was like, God, you're in this, aren't you? And it was like, yes. <laughs> he's like, I have another plan. You don't have to become a nun. <laughs> yeah, I have an awesome husband for you. It's, it's good in all your, your motivation. But anyway, but let me tell you this. The first place is husband and wife. We courted long distance for a year before we got married. But the first place God took us to as husband and wife was upstate New York, the very place I said I will never go back to. And I remember, honey, right, we got we stayed in a little inn there. We were ministering at a Mennonite church of all people, Mennonite church in upstate New York. And I got in that inn, and I fell on the floor, and I cried like a baby. And I said, how dare you bring me back to this place? How dare you bring me back here? Because it was so painful for me. But I felt like God did something to my heart. Like, I felt like he was saying, it's, this is a valley of Mara for you. It's bitter, but I want to make it sweet. And he did. And I'm not saying everybody opened me with open arms, like, you're awesome, you're good. But God brought me back doing something. And he continues to do a good work. But let me tell you what. It's easy to look back, right, to say, to look at the loss and the pain. Why didn't that marriage work out? Why didn't Alicia die? And God was like, you got to stop looking back because every time you do, you take your eyes off from me and where the good place that I have you going because you can't dwell there because it's painful and hurtful and God doesn't want you to. Like you deal with the pain and he deals with the pain, but I don't live there anymore. I don't live there anymore. God's given me an amazing husband and I'm blessed. I'm blessed today. And I, and I, for a long time, I felt like I didn't deserve to be happy. How many people feel like I just don't deserve to be happy? But I do. And God is a good God. And it doesn't matter. I felt like I used to have a big divorce, you know, on this, my chest. Like, who's going to want me in their church? Speaking of all people, I have no credibility, but I do. I can speak to things that nobody else has authority over. Suicide, I can address that. Divorce, loss, pain. It's something when you've, it's relatable, and it's, in this album, I wrote this album the last year of my marriage, God took my ex-husband now to Iraq for a year, and when you're in an abusive marriage, it was the first time in my life in that marriage that I felt like I could speak, and I began to pour my heart, and a lot of it is just, just scripture that I started singing back to God of all the hurt and pain in my life, because he wanted to hear it. He wanted to hear what was in here, but for a long time I was like, God, if you only knew, he's like, you need to go in your car and you need to holler and you need to 
you like verbally say, I'm mad at you, I'm mad. And then I did, and I screamed, I think I swore. <laughs> and But he's like, he wanted to hear what was inside of me because I, when I was in an abusive marriage, you couldn't say anything. You couldn't say anything other than yes or no, I agree with you or I disagree, you know, you couldn't disagree. And, um, but I voiced my, my life is in that, that music. I got behind a piano again, and I began to sing to my father who wanted to hear what was inside of me. And God is so good. So thank you for letting me share. <laughs> God is still in the business of restoring lives. Don't hear Tanya's testimony and think, well, that's just an isolated story. You know, I'm in a room filled with testimonies. We are all testimonies in the making. See, so often we think a testimony is only about how I can shout when I'm victorious and on top of the mountain. But who knows that we don't live on the mountaintops? most of the time it seems life is walking through the valleys. But see, I've learned and I've experienced, and Otania has, he's not only God of the mountaintops, he's also God of the valleys. He's not only God when you're walking in victory, but he's God on the beach when you've shipwrecked your life. And I just see the incredible testimony that um, of Tanya's life and the encouragement she is, you know, she is a testimony and a miracle in the making. But aren't we all? You know, I stand up here, no claim to fame. Okay, my background, uh, those of you who don't know, I was the former lead singer and co-founder for almost 18 years of one of the biggest Christian bands in the world, Ooh, uh, the Newsboys. And, uh, but that's not my claim to fame, even though many people may know me from the newsboys, if if I have anything to boast about today, it wasn't how many albums we sold, you know, how many number one songs we had, you know, what's the biggest crowd we ever played in front of. If I'm going to boast about anything, let me boast about our heavenly Father. That brings the the strength and the hope that everyday ordinary people like you and I if we will humble ourselves under the mighty hand and allow him into our mess, into our struggle, into our pain, if we will allow him in and yield our lives to him, how he can give us the strength to get up. See, I believe the testimony isn't only the mountaintops, it's scars and all. I believe the testimony we have isn't only the victories, but it's openly talking about the tragic defeats, the mistakes, the pain. Recently, Tanya and I, um, we spent a week uh, in schools uh, in, in where Parisburg, Virginia. And uh, the God gave us favor. We got into six public schools. I mean, we did like eight assemblies over the week, then an awesome event. Um, and then on the Sunday, we were at a local church, a little local church. And on the Sunday, there was this young teenage girl. She came whose life was impacted at the schools where we were speaking and then at the event. And on Sunday, she came and brought her mother. And it was great. She was just glowing and God had done and began an awesome work in her life. And she was so excited. But she brought her mother and introduced me to her mother. And, and I met her mom, who was a believer. Her mom didn't go to that church, but she came with her daughter. And, and her mother was just the most beautiful Christian lady, just, just glowing with the love of the Lord. Later on, the pastor come up to me and said, um, you know that lady you were speaking to with the young girl there? And I said, yeah. He said, do you know who that lady was? I said, no. He goes, let me quickly tell you. That woman has the most incredible testimony. Uh, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, um, one Saturday morning or whatever day it was, she woke up and said to the oldest child, she had six children, said to the oldest one, just going down to the corner store to get some groceries. I'll be back in a few minutes. So she went to the store like she probably had hundreds of times before not long later she gets in a car she drives home and she pulls into her street to behold the most horrific shocking sight there was a gas explosion in her home but her home was no longer there all six children killed and 
I'm looking at this lady and I'm thinking, how is it that you are still even standing? How, how is it that you are still able to walk forward? How is it that you are not just angry and bitter and twisted and, and jaded and resentful for God? How could you do this to me? To actually see this woman being able to stand there and glow with the love of the Lord and to honestly be able to say, God is good. And to see her worshiping God, I'm thinking, man, that woman has experienced the power of God like I, I don't know yet. You talk about peace that surpasses understanding, that this woman has literally experienced the power of Christ, that even in the midst of her pain, her tragedy, her grief, her loss, there's something profoundly spiritual that this God who we sing about, this God who we talk about, is far more than a pep talk on a Saturday night. He's far more than an inspirational song we sing. He's far more. And so often what we hear in churches, see, I can't help but think, but sometimes on our road of wellness, on wholeness, of recovery, because we're all recovering from something. <laughs> we're all needing a miracle, you know. Just sometimes in the church, we, better, we do a better job of hiding the truth and lying. Your world can be falling apart, but we can still come to church on a Sunday morning and walk into church and we're greeted at the door and somebody says, how are you doing today? And we're like, oh, praise God, fantastic. And we're like, we're all a bunch of liars. <laughs> we feel the pressure of just, you know, I've got to keep up the appearance. But I pray tonight and I ask God for forgiveness. Because sometimes I can't help but think, have we been in the church or around church circles for so long that it's like we've become institutionalized? I mean, you know, we know, we know in the scripture, little just, I'll, I'll read it to you, okay? Here, listen to this. It's, it's, it's simple and profound, but you know it well. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, you know this as well as anybody. It says this, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in our midst. But we sing that and we know it and we talk about it. But it's like we've become desensitized to the power of that. That tonight, when we came together, two or three, something profoundly spiritual happened. That because two of the, or three of us were here in his name, all of a sudden, his majesty has walked in. His majesty is here. The king of kings, the lord of lords, the redeemer, the restorer, the deliverer, the, the healer. He's literally here in our presence. And when I read scripture, and I read the, the four epistles and the accounts in the New Testament of what happened when Jesus showed up on the scene. Oh, lies were changed. <laughs> lies were set free. Lies were, were delivered. Lies were healed. Lies were ticked off. <laughs> you name it. What a reaction. But I can't help but think, God, do we just take that for granted? And what is possible when... We come together in your name. What is possible when we encounter you? When we encounter you, does, does that mean we every time we have to leave exactly the same way as we walked in? But being in your presence, a chain still able to be broken? Is hope still able to be given to the hopeless? Is life still able to be given to the lifeless? I can't help but think, Lord, if the power of that scripture, the power of that scripture, what I just read, just imagine tonight if that was revealed to you and I. <laughs> During worship, when Tanya was up here, all of a sudden, every one of us, while we were standing here or sitting or in this auditorium, all of a sudden, our eyes were open spiritually. And each and every one of us, could actually see the Lord Jesus Christ standing here in our presence. 
If that happened to us tonight, I can't help but think, would it have changed the way we worshipped? <laughs> would, we would we have been a little bit more enthusiastic or passionate? or vigorous, or boisterous? Would we be as willing to just sit there and look around and check a text on our phone, or, oh, I got another like on my post? <laughs> I think if that happened to me tonight, and my eyes were open, and I saw Jesus, and all of a sudden he looked at me sitting over there in the back, and he looked in my direction, I would want him to see me <laughs> worshipping him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my passion, as if my life depended on it. God, help us, forgive us, that we can come together and just take that for granted, that we forget the power of the gospel, the power of salvation, the power of of the cross, the power of God. See, if you take the power of God out of the gospel, what is the gospel? If you take the power of the cross, the shed blood of Jesus, uh, the miracle of that out of this message, what hope is there? What hope is there for anybody on the journey of wholeness, of recovery? See, so often in America, there's been a, a gospel that's been sold and we drunk this sweet Kool-Aid of a gospel. And it tastes so good and it's so sweet and it goes down so easily. It's almost like it's this gospel. Hey, come to Jesus. Well, why should we? Let me tell you. Because he has the most incredible, amazing, spectacular, amazing plan and life for you. Like, really? I mean, it's spectacular, the plan he has for you. I mean, you don't need to ever worry about anything else financially, physically, mentally, emotionally. Come to Jesus. He is the most incredible life enhancement God you could ever have. He's like your 24-7 ATM and magic genie in the sky. He has the most amazing plan and for you. And he can't wait for you to sign up. I'm like, oh, sign me up. If that's Jesus, I'll take two of them. Thank you. But see, that's not the gospel message. Does he have a plan for our lives? Actually, he does. But that's not the gospel message. That's not why we're, we're propelled, why we come. The gospel message is this, that we're all sinners, that we're all broken. Every man, woman, and child that has ever been born was born into sin because of sin, every person on the face of the planet was separated from God. That we are all under the wrath and the judgment of a holy God. But because He is a holy God, He's also a just God. And He understood for the price of sin, there had to be an atonement. There had to be a price that was paid. And He knew that humanity, that you and I could never pay that price. We could never be good enough, worthy enough, holy enough, righteous enough. <laughs> There's nothing you and I could ever do to satisfy that price of sin. And that's why this incredible God in His love sent His Son to die on a cross, to shed His blood for our sin, for our brokenness, for our abuse, for our addictions, you name it. He became sin. That's the gospel message, that we're all broken. We're all under the judgment and the wrath of God, but God and His mercy. For God so loved the world. We're all on a journey of transformation. When you realize that we all are in desperate need of a Savior. Have you ever heard anyone say, you know, you Christians, Jesus is like your crutch. You need a crutch. I'm like... My crutch, he's my wheelchair. <laughs> he's my everything. Mate, he's the very reason we woke up today and we have a heartbeat. 
He holds the heavens in the palm of his hand. Because of him, the sun rose today. Because of him, the sun set. Because of him, the very atoms are being held together. Because of his will and his desire. He's my crutch. I can do nothing without him. He's our everything. He's the very breath of air that I just breathed into my lungs because he willed it and he purposed it. He is our everything. But the world doesn't know him and the world can never know him unless they come to a place of experiencing the power of the cross and coming to that fundamental, foundational place of realizing we're lost and there's no hope. We desperately need a saviour. But this saviour who calls us, he isn't like the most ultimate insurance policy that the world could ever know. Come to Jesus. Who's experienced this? Come to Jesus and you will never face problems ever again. (laughs) Come to Jesus and you'll never go through heartache or loss or pain or grief or abuse or abandonment. So we love that Jesus, but I'm like, I don't see that Jesus in the Bible. He never ever said we would be isolated from the herd of the world. But what he did say, that whatever you go through as my son or my daughter, I promise that I will never leave you or forsake you. Whatever you go through may wound you, may knock the wind out of your sail, may knock you to your knees. But if you will trust me, I will give you the strength through my spirit to be able to stand up again. I hear the testimony that Tanya shares and I wish she had time to actually talk about. We'd be, we actually have been married now um, two and a half years, almost three years. And I remember about a, how long, Dale? About a year after we were married. You talk about putting your Christianity to the test. Her dad, her biological father, That man she spoke about reached out to her and said, hey, can I come and live with you? Oh, man. That'll test your Christianity. And, you know, I won't get Tanya back up, but that man, how long did he live with us for, Dale? Five months. And um, he saw the way we live, the way we are as believers not just when we're on the stage but it's easy to be great and inspiration when you're up here with a mic in front of everybody but when I'm not on the stage when I'm at home how do I treat my wife (laughs) how do I love my wife how do I act when no one's around and you know he saw us living in our home he came to church that man not been to church ever hey doesn't know the Lord never gone to church he came to church for the first time in his life is that right, Dale? I think he came. He came to church and heard his daughter sing for the first time ever. And he, how long was he there, Dale, again? Five months. So we're out ministering somewhere um, just for the weekend. And we said, hey, Dad, we'll be home Sunday afternoon. We pulled up Sunday afternoon into the driveway and Dad's truck's gone. Well, where's Dad? Tony said, I wonder if he just went down to the shop. We go inside. She goes into his room, all his clothes are gone, his suitcase is packed, and he's just gone. No note, no phone call, no nothing. And she's like, he flippin' did it to me again. He just walked out. And you talk about potentially the enemy wanting to come and rip open that old scar and that old wound of abandonment. But I saw Christ in my wife. She made a decision to forgive. Not for her dad's sake, but for her sake. She made a decision to honor. Did he deserve it? Absolutely not. She made a decision. The Bible says to honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say honor them just because they deserve it or they've been a great mum, a great dad, or there for you. It's a spiritual choice. See, from a biblical perspective, honor is so different. See, from the world's perspective, You know, I'll respect you, I'll honor you if you show me some fruit. Uh, You know, respect is earned. You've got to earn it, and I might give you some respect. You want honor? You need to earn it and get some honor points up, and then maybe I'll start to to honor you. But see, kingdom's so different. With kingdom, honor isn't earned. 
It's a choice. It's given. And she still has boundaries. She understands that her dad is toxic. And so often toxic people, we can honor them and love them, but they have boundaries now. And we can honor them and love them from a distance. But man, you talk about seeing the ongoing journey of Christ. What my wife didn't tell you also, when the Lord brought us up on our journey of healing individually as a for Tanya, when we were in that little inn up in New York State, and uh, first night in the inn in her where she was from, she fell down and wept. And how dare you, God, bring me back to here. You don't realize the power of that, her hometown. A mile down the road, her niece is buried. Her mother's buried. You talk about pain. But like she said, God brought her back with a testimony. But there were some things she had to face. There were some challenges, some mountains she had to overcome. And it was the most incredible experience. Look, we're all on a journey, eh? And it's my prayer, whatever has you here at Recovery Church, whatever... Whatever ongoing work of healing and restoration that God is doing in your life, let me say, he hasn't brought you this far to abandon you. Tanya made the most profound statement. She said, she got to a place in life, she said, I am so damaged goods. I have a huge D, divorce. Who's going to want somebody like me? I've been divorced three times I have so many wounds so many scars so much so much baggage but God but God and to see you know I'm divorced <laughs> I lost my career through wrong choices having it all gaining the world and uh, losing it all being consumed with success and addictions in my life that I battled with that took its toll on my ministry on my marriage I lost all of that <laughs> it's like damaged goods there's no hope. Strike three, game over. But God, God is in the business of taking broken, messed up, wounded, discarded people <laughs> and bringing in a miraculous testimony out of it. And that's what the world needs to hear, testimonies. And I look, you know, if God can use Tanya and I and we get to use our life's journey as a testimony to encourage others. I think, God, if, if you can use Tanya and I, what can God do with you? And it's not about, hey, you're all going to travel around America as evangelists, as missionaries. Hey, you know, we're all on the mission field. You know, this ridiculous notion, well, one day, God, one day when I'm ready and prepared and anointed enough, one day I'm going to be on the mission field. Well, well you want to be on the mission field? Huh? Uh, there, I anointed you. Now go. You're all on the mission field. <laughs> this, you, know, you don't need to have letters before or after your name. You don't need to have a title and work at a, a local church. Listen, you can be a gardener, an accountant, a plumber, a carpenter, school teacher, counselor landscaper, unemployed. When you answered the call when Jesus said, come, follow me, you're on the mission field. You're on the, we're all in the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the loss, using our lives as a living, breathing billboard. Eh? Let me leave you with, uh, with this, and then you can break for a few minutes. Eh? If you go, I'll leave, leave you with one scripture here, but I want to, that I want to leave you with. Listen to this. I love this particular translation. I love how it words it. And this, this particular translation, it's Psalm chapter 50, verse 1. In this translation, it says this. The God of gods, the mighty Lord himself has spoken. He shouts out over all the people of the earth in every brilliant sunrise and every beautiful sunset saying, listen to me. I love how it words it. It paints this picture of this incredible God, but it, he's shouting. And I'm like, well, why is he shouting? Does he think we're all deaf? <laughs> or why is he shouting? 
Is he like desperately thinks we're hard of hearing? Why is he shouting? According to this, with every beautiful sunrise, with every magnificent sunset, God is shouting to the people of the earth. And what's he saying? Listen to me. But why is he shouting? And again, I think, don't we live in a world where we are being bombarded 24-7 with so much noise? Through social media, through the news, through politics, through this, through that. Oh my gosh, everybody, 24-7, we're being told what to do, how to think, how to act, how to live, what to wear, not what to wear, what to wear, don't wear, do this. It's like never ending. We are bombarded with so much noise that we've almost gotten to a place where we feel so uncomfortable around silence. Some of us even have to have noise on, even to fall asleep at night. And it's like, why is God shouting? It's like he's trying to get through all the noise. It's like we're so willing to turn up the volume and listen to everybody else. You have a problem? Listen to this source. You have this? Listen to that. We're so willing to listen to everything else in this world. And God is shouting through the noise, trying to get our attention each morning, each sunset, each day. And what's he saying? Would you listen to me? If you'll just turn down the noise, turn it down and just listen to me. I'll instruct you how to live, how to walk, how to respond, how to love. How to, how to walk now in strength and hope, not with anxiety and fear and depression. If you will listen to me and allow me to begin to teach you by my spirit and begin to renew your minds with my word from my perspective. I'll begin to teach you to make new paths. You know, so often we have these neural pathways in our mind you know what I'm talking about? Where, where our natural response, it's like a well-worn pathway, and we default to the way we respond. It's just our natural response. But God is saying, I mean, I'm going to teach you new pathways, <laughs> but I'm gonna, it takes time of renewing. And that's why God is saying to each and every one of us every day, would you listen to me? Come on. Allow me to instruct and teach and guide you. Amen. So it's my prayer, as you continue your journey of wholeness and wellness, like Tanya and I, we're on a journey of wholeness and wellness. He's far from finished of the work he wants to do in my life and Tanya's. Why? Because one day when we stand before him, you know what he wants to see? His own reflection in you and I, Christ-like. And it's a work in progress, amen? We're not dead yet. There's no retirement. Don't buy into that. You might think, well, I'm retired. What a load of rubbish. There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. Show me that in the scripture. Now, you may retire from your natural vocation. You worked hard. You've deserved it. But we never retire from the kingdom of God. Uh, We retire when we breathe our last breath. (laughs) <laughs> until we die. Now, I might not have as, mu- have as much energy as these youngins here on the front row. But I tell you what, as long as I have a heartbeat, there's something I can do. It might take me a lot longer to get going each day. This body doesn't want to cooperate like it used to. But as long as I have a heartbeat, I refuse to retire and sit down. There is some way I can serve God. Here I am. Here I am. Use me, Lord. Let my life be a service in your hand. So I pray that God would continue to teach us all and instruct us as we're all on the journey of being changed into the image and likeness of Christ. Amen. Bow your heads. Father, I thank you for every one of my brothers and sisters here tonight. A room filled with testimonies in the making. Continue to have your way as we all make a decision with every dawn, with every sunset, to humble ourselves, to turn down the noise, to listen to you, to give you rightful control of the steering wheel of our lives. Thank you for the good work you have begun in each of these one's lives. 
But thank you, Father, that the good work continues. That we would all understand the responsibility and the hope of the calling we have all received as ambassadors of Christ, as sons and daughters of this awesome God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Just before, you're up here already. I want to let you, Tanya mentioned, um, we actually, she has her worship CD out there. Um, we leave, we're speaking in, um, in a church tomorrow and we head back to West Virginia where we're ministering. We'll probably do about 80,000 miles in the car this year uh, as missionaries to America. If you'd like to sow, and I'm not going to give you a big spiel because I'm not into that. But when you walked in, you might have seen some canvases out there. Uh, I'm a bit of a nerdy photographer. I'm not very good, but everyone takes photos today. Eh? You got a camera or whatever. Uh, everywhere we travel and minister, uh, we've been taking photographs and putting a scripture on it. And uh, if you'd like to sow into our ministry so we can keep doing what we do in schools and, and rehab and churches, um, we'd appreciate you can get a canvas and support us. But if you do get a canvas, uh, we'd love to just bless you and give you for free. Uh, Tanya's beautiful worship album, all, for, all original songs. But that's out there. Tanya will be out there if you want to get a canvas. We'll give you the CD. And that's just the way you can sow into it and support us um, as we travel around as missionaries to America, eh? What a novel idea, eh? Missionaries to America. I love that. Thank you, Pastor Lowell. Thanks, mate. <laughs> great, great word. Well, that's what I was going to tell you next was make sure you stop outside and spend some time with him uh, and, and look at the artwork. He's done a great job as a former professional photographer. He says he's an amateur, but there's some pretty good stuff out there. Um, this is a time before we break for that. Um, I, I want you to know what we do here is in, in most 12-step traditions, they have a, a chip or a key tag. Uh, here we use crosses. And so if there's something that you want to lay at the foot of the cross, something you want to get up, he talked about the, the pains and the hurts and the, and the forgiveness. And so it doesn't have to be a substance. It can be some of the emotional stuff that we carry that we don't need to because he will carry it for us. But if you have something you want to leave at the foot of the cross and let him carry it for you, come on up and get what we call a surrender cross. You're surrendering that part of your life to him to let him do the work because, quite frankly, we can't anyway. Right, And that's the whole beauty, and that's what recovery is about, is letting God do for us what we could not do for ourselves. You're off camera if you're over there, just so you know the camera only goes to here. So if you come around this way and you want to pick up a cross, go ahead and do that. Also, if you want one of the books that we have here, uh, we've got some, some one, a few from uh, Dr. David Jeremiah. We've got some Max Lucado. Again, uh, Healing the Shame is a great book as well, and uh, the Life Recovery Bibles. Uh, come on up and get them if you'd like. Otherwise, uh, go out and spend a little time and, you know, thank David and Tanya for, uh, John and Tanya for coming here and, and doing what they do and giving of their time so freely for us. And uh, again, if you're online, uh, you missed it. You should have been here. It's, it's kind of hard to get a signature on the, on the painting from John if, he's, if you're not here. Uh, make sure that you are in the future. And I hope that we get to have them back again sometime when they're in the area. Thank you all for being here.